Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I know there are still some people who are yet to join, uh, but because it's four o'clock Singapore time, we can start it. Um, before we start, a um, few house rules. Uh, you have your cameras and your mic have been kept on uh, mute, so you won't be able to speak during the master class. But after the master class, if time permits, we will have a Q and A session to answer any questions that you might have. Also, uh, the webinar recording would be made available to all the registered participants. We will share a link uh, to the recording so that you can see it later as well in case you want to do that. OK, let's start. So. Uh, today's uh, masterclass is around green hydrogen and ammonia financial modeling, wherein we would be covering basically three main topics. Uh, one is around the basics. What are the various plant components? The project economics. So we, we will understand production, storage, transport of green hydrogen. Uh, and we'll also talk, talk about end use cases and then a financial modeling wherein I will take you through a sample financial model for, to one, for you to understand what are the key parameters that we need as input assumptions and how the levelized cost of uh, green hydrogen can be computed. So it's a live financial model which we will showcase in the class towards the later part of the session. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am Abhinav. Uh, I'm the founder and managing director of Yog Infra, which is an infrastructure focused financial advisory firm. Uh, we have three offices. One is in Singapore, India and UAE. So we focus on Southeast Asia, South Asia and Middle East as a key focus markets. I've been doing infra advisory for more than 13 years now. And a large part of that was with big, big four consulting firms. OK, let's move on. So talking about a little bit of basics uh, before we go into the details. So uh, most of you in the room would be aware that green hydrogen may have different shades or different colors, as we call it. Uh, here in this session, the focus is really on green hydrogen. So. You, you see green, blue, other types of hydrogen here. So we are focusing on hydrogen, which is produced from renewable energy, either through PV, wind, battery. And then you have an electrolyzer in place, which produces hydrogen, which can then either stored or transported through pipelines or other modes of transport towards the end use case. So the end use cases may have industry, transport, heating, and power generation. And green ammonia is one step ahead of green hydrogen. So as you see here, you still have renewable energy and water coming in for electrolysis, wherein you produce green hydrogen. So that part remains the same as the earlier part. However, here you also have air, pure air coming in. Uh, there's something called ASU, air separation unit, that forms a part of the overall plant, which when combined with hydrogen gives you uh, uh, this air separation unit will take out nitrogen from the air. Hydrogen and nitrogen through this process called Haber-Bosch process will give you green ammonia. So as you can understand from this process, from a financial modeling perspective, the capex of green ammonia projects would always be higher around in the range of 25 to 30% higher compared to a pure green hydrogen plant. And in our case study, when we go to the financial modeling, we have assumed that the developer is only setting up a green hydrogen plant, meaning it's not an integrated plant. An integrated plant refers to something wherein the whole value chain, meaning the same developer is also producing the renewable energy, is also then using that renewable energy to put the electrolyzer, generate green hydrogen, and then sell it to the offtake. That's an integrated plant, wherein a green hydrogen developer would only put up the electrolyzer. He would purchase renewable energy from the grid or from other developers and then produce green hydrogen for the ultimate offtake. So there are two kinds of developers in the market right now. So about green ammonia, it is essentially primarily it is being used to produce fertilizer products for decarbonizing the food value chain. And this is also a potential for climate neutral shipping fuel. So Ammonia is not new commodity in the market. It has been produced for a very long time and it's second most widely produced commodity 
commodity chemical globally. Now, this diagram is another value chain that you would see how to take care of when you do financial modeling. So yes, we talked about the renewable power sources. So either in your financial model, this would look as individual capex components for an integrated plant, or there would be a single input of a renewable energy power purchase price for financial modeling. Then on electrolysis, this would be a capex component would be coming in. Uh, there are certain breakups of this electrolyzer component, which I'll show you when we go to the production part, but all those components uh, would either be shown separately uh, in your model or they would be a single value for electrolyzer capex. Then uh, green hydrogen plus nitrogen, uh, you would synthesize into ammonia. So this ammonia, the transportation of ammonia and then decomposition of ammonia into green hydrogen. So these three boxes that you see, this is specifically applicable for a case wherein hydrogen is being transported from one part to another part using ammonia as a uh, method of storage and transportation. So there are different methods of storage and transportation of green hydrogen. Uh, we will again discuss about that when we move that to that transportation part. This value chain assumes it as a ammonia. And then of course being used as power generation production engines and fuel cells when it is decomposed into green hydrogen. Right, so this is another pictorial way. The reason we have, we have so many graphs showcasing you and pictures showcasing the value chain is because the it's very important to understand this value chain before you take on any financial assessment so that you don't miss out on any component of the cost, the true cost of green hydrogen that is coming out of the plant, because sometimes people miss out on the offtake cost, because even if you have to transport hydrogen from your plant to the end use case, you might miss out on the transportation cost. Uh, you might miss on the transportation cost of materials itself, like electrolyzer coming from the factory into the uh, plant. So those logistics costs may be missed out. So that's why it's very important to understand how this production process is moving so that all the financial elements are captured in the uh, assessment. So here you have wind solar uh, as a power generation. You have ASU coming in. As mentioned before, you have an electrolyzer. So power into electrolyzer gives you hydrogen. From ASU, you get nitrogen. You combine hydrogen, nitrogen together, you get ammonia. So this ammonia can then either be used directly as fertilizers or it can be dissociated, uh, decomposed or dissociated again to produce hydrogen, which again then can be used for uh, vehicles or any other end use case. Okay, so then what are the revenue and cost drivers across the value chain that you need to take care of? First, let's talk about production. So if you are doing any sort of financial assessment in the near future, you may encounter possibly three types of electrolyzer technologies available in the market. One is alkaline, one is PEM, and then the third one is called solid state, which is still an emerging technology, although some developers or some countries are using that, but it's a very, very nascent technology. So today the focus is on the two most commonly used technologies, which is alkaline and PEM. So alkaline electrolysis is well, the most mature technology uh, that is there in the market. It would be good to for you to make note of these numbers. Uh, if you have a, if you're carrying a notepad, you know, because this is the number that you should see as an electrolyzer cost in your models. So for an alkaline electrolyzer, the cost would be around 500 to 1000 USD per kilowatt capacity. And for PEM, that's slightly expensive, which is 700 to 1400. So these are the rates which are as of 2020. One, uh, sorry, 2022. Uh, in 2023, these rates are uh, set to drop down by another 10 to 15 percent based as the technology evolves. But this is the latest uh, rates that are still being used for the financial assessments that we are doing uh, for our clients. Uh, 
either electric alkaline or PEN. Uh, then the lifetime, 1000 hours. So this is the life of uh, the electrolyzer itself. So before, so it's very similar to a battery cycles cost, like a battery might have 30,000 cycles or 35,000 cycles for advanced technologies, or it can be as slow as 16,000 cycles. So similarly, this is the lifetime in terms of hours, how this is measured. It is not measured in terms of years. So for an electrolyzer, which is used 340 days in a year, uh, of course, it will have to be replaced earlier, uh, earlier compared to an electrolyzer, which is only used, for example, maybe 200 days in a year. So that's how it it is defined. So 60,000 hours for alkaline and 50 to 80,000 hours for PEM. Of course, the efficiency of PEM is slightly higher and this technology is more uh, faster to respond as well. Uh, what I mean by that is in case there is a variable renewable energy power that you're getting as input. So the variability of the renewable energy power affects the electrolyzer generation capacity. So and PEM technology uh, is able to adjust very quickly based on the renewable energy input it is getting in the electrolyzer. So it's more faster to respond. It takes a few seconds. Alkaline is a little longer, but it's still manageable with control systems. So uh, given the cost of alkaline being lower, majority of the electrolyzers that you see in the market are in this category. Uh, unless PEM cost, there's still a high cost differential to really justify the operational readiness it has. So that's why as PEM technology's cost comes down, then we would see more and more uh, a solid business case for having this technology in a lot of the uh, projects going forward. So uh, as I said, alkaline is the most common electrolyzer technology. Uh, it recirculates the electrolyte, which is potassium hydro hydroxide, into and out of the stack components to separate hydrogen from water and it requires a constant flow of the water power. A PEM stands for proton exchange membrane, which is a more later technology or a modern electrolyzer technology, which is known for higher efficiency and production rates. As you can see from here, it has a higher efficiency and it has a lower electricity demand as well. So because of the lower electricity demand, it has a higher production rate per ton of renewable energy that is fed into the electrolyzer. So uh, one unique thing about it is that, as I said, this PEM is more adaptable to different environments. So whether the variable, the variability of the renewable energy or even the variability of the pressure, this is more adaptable technology compared to alkaline. So as I said, yeah, so please note, take a note of these numbers because this is the range that you should get. So if, if someone comes up with a project in which the alkaline electrolyzer cost of alkaline is 40, 1500 or 1600, then it means that something is wrong because it, it is generally within this range. It should not be beyond this range. Now let's talk about the different cost of components within electrolyzer. Uh, the breakup that I showed you earlier, 500 to 1000, uh, for alkaline and around 700 to 1400 for PEM. This is the broad breakup of different components. Now, very often when we work on uh, green hydrogen projects, uh, sometimes we do get these breakups, but uh, many times it's just a single number that we work with because some of the some of these projects are, in fact, most of these projects are on drawing board or on a PPT format. You know, it's still under evaluation. There is no real work on the ground. Uh, but if as the project progresses, these are the four key components that you should see uh, in a financial assessment for an electrolyzer capacity. So the first level is a single set unit, where is, which is the core of the electrochemical process. I have tried to explain it in very simple terms. Of course, uh, the technicalities can be quite complex when you start reading about it, but Broadly, you need to get, take care about these. Uh, first level is single unit. The second level is a stack. So uh, what you call here, this is the major component, 270 to 450 range for alkaline and 400 to 70. So this contributes to 50 to 60 percent of the total electrolyzer cost. And then the third level is a system cost. So that includes all the other things like electronics, gas conditioning, balance of plant, etc. 
Um, one thing I also uh, want to highlight here that uh, when we do green hydrogen projects, uh, as an input, there are two key requirements. One is your renewable energy, and the other is your uh, uh, water, pure water. So in regions where the water is not available, some developers also try to incorporate a desalination plant as part of the integrated project. Now, once you do that, of course, as you can see, the cost overall cost of the hydrogen would increase because the additional capex coming in. So that's also one thing to uh, take care of when we do financial assessments that what is the source of water that has been assumed for the project development. OK. Uh, let me also enable Q&A for the session so that in case you have any questions, you can at least type it on the chat and uh, I will try to answer them towards the end. So we can show the Q&A part. Then, OK, so that's about the production. Now the second part is around storage. Uh, once the hydrogen is produced, it's, it's very important to understand how is it stored and how is it transported. So that's the second part of the value chain that you need to take care of. Uh, so hydrogen is very different from other gases that you would have encountered in the past because it is you need high pressure, low temperature or both to do this. So as you understand that Hydrogen containers or cylinders are specially constructed cylinders. So it's in reality, even if you want to do a hydrogen project, you need to sort out that what is your supply chain for components because there's a limited amount of electrolyzer capacity available in the market. Similarly, even the cylinders in which the hydrogen would be stored or transported, there are two or three categories of cylinders available. One is a very large cylinder, which you can say is size of a truck. Uh, a 14 foot or 16 foot truck or the other one is a uh, like uh, the normal cylinders which you the oxygen cylinders that you have in hospital so something like that also those are available which are cheaper but the amount of hydrogen that you can carry in the smaller cylinders is much less compared to the bigger 14 15 14 to 16 foot cylinders and that's why if you have to transport hydrogen to a larger distance then you need to assess which one is a better uh, transportation medium. Uh, but in any case, whether whichever you choose, the cylinders have to be specially constructed. The normal oxygen cylinders that you see in the market or the gas cylinders won't work because you need stronger walls. Hydrogen has a is much more heavier compared to the normal gases that we encounter. Similarly, when you do transport this hydrogen over a slightly longer distance, then there is an energy penalty. What energy penalty means is that although you are using renewable energy to generate hydrogen, uh, and suppose you're able to get a green hydrogen, which is 90% or 95% green as certified by an external agency, but then when you transport over long distances, there's a refrigeration cost that needs to be incurred. And that refrigeration modality is going to be either fossil fuel based or the refrigeration can be not necessarily a fuel cell truck. It can be a non renewable energy source for that refrigeration. So if you do that, then the percentage of green would reduce in that hydrogen. So that's also very important that the energy penalty equation also needs to be taken into account when green hydrogen is transported. So as I said, uh, forms of storage, the storage in gaseous form requires high pressures over 300 bar uh, because it is. It has a low density. It is 10 times lighter than methane. And to store hydrogen as a liquid, it must be cooled below minus 250 degrees Celsius, which is 80 degrees lower than LNG. So as I said, uh, I showed up a value chain again uh, earlier in which ammonia is being used to transport hydrogen. When, now when you do that, uh, the conversion of hydrogen into ammonia and then conversion into hydrogen back from ammonia there are two things that you need to take into account. One is the energy losses because you need to incur energy 
of power to conversion in the conversion process itself. And the second is the loss of hydrogen itself. Uh, so up to 20-25% uh, of the output hydrogen will be lost in this association and disassociation process. So because once you construct ammonia and when you deconstruct ammonia, then also there's a loss of in hydrogen. So those things also need to take into account because that would actually increase your effective levelized cost of hydrogen towards for the end user if you account for all these losses. So many times people miss out on these things and that's why it's very important that you, you take into account of these things as well. And that's why storage becomes important. So yeah. Till date, based on the economics that we have seen so far, it is more economical to move big hydrogen users to hydrogen producers location rather than to ship hydrogen across distances. So that's why uh, hydrogen as a production, you would see it's more fragmented because it's near to the load center or the user and user of hydrogen rather than being at a, at a centralized location wherein it is then being transported to different places. So it doesn't look like that. So it's very different from an oil well or refinery. It is very close to its end use. And those are the real bankable projects because if it's very far, it, it's a it's a very high likelihood that you're incurring so much cost for transportation storage that the project viability, financial viability becomes very low. Um, so th there are a few th ways that you can actually store uh, green hydrogen. One is a gaseous state, a liquid state, and a solid state. Uh, because talking about ammonia here, so this is, you know, I've just circled it out that it's essentially to a way to store in liquid state, wherein uh, this is the benchmark LCOS. Uh, LCOS stands for levelized cost of storage. So for different things, of course, if you go to natural storage methods, so these are all natural storage methods, you know, salt caverns, gas fields, rock caverns. So these are all, uh, these can store large volumes of hydrogen in gaseous form, and they are quite cheap. Uh, containers, as I mentioned, they can only store very small volume, uh, but they have, of course, a lower cost as well. If you want to have storage for large volumes and for a longer period of time, like months or weeks, uh, then these are the three ways to do it. Liquid hydrogen, ammonia, and liquid organic hydrogen carriers, out of which ammonia right now is still the cheapest, even after. Um, so if, if you account for energy penalty or the disassociation association loss, then also this is still cheaper. This number does not account for that. It would be slightly higher if you account for the energy conversion cost as well as the loss of green hydrogen. Um, so yeah, so one other advantage is that these three natural forms are limited because they are only in certain parts of Europe and US. This is available, whereas for others, it's not really limited by location. You can use it to various locations, provided you have the right supply chain in place. Then, then let's come to the transport part. Uh, so, uh, there, there are four modes, essential modes of transport that has been used for hydrogen. One is a pipeline. Now, one way to uh, some of the developers think about transporting this is that you have an existing gas pipeline. Why not just use that to transport hydrogen also? Uh, this is applicable only for certain cases, not for every case. Reason being that, as I mentioned before, hydrogen is very different from natural gas. So unless the pipes are of uh, uh, sufficient strength and quality, they may not be used for hydrogen transport. Uh, so many developers uh, and even the governments, what they're thinking of is retrofitting these pipes because you already have a very good pipeline network uh, which goes to the end user. So whether we can use this pipeline network again, whether we can retrofit it or make it more robust such that it can be used for hydrogen. So that's one conversation that we see uh, among the developers and the uh, government agencies. Uh, marine storage and handling terminals and ports. So this is one of the most common uh, transport me mechanisms. 
especially if you want to export hydrogen to a different location. Uh, however, when you do ship transport or marine transport, the carriers have to be specially modified or adopted for transporting green hydrogen. Uh, and especially the, the terminals also. So it's not just about modifying the ship, but even when the ship docks at a port, it cannot dock in any other port, you know. So there has to be facilities even at the port terminal to be able to handle uh, hydrogen. So that's why we see some of the renovations or enhancements being done at certain ports around the world so that they can handle uh, green hydrogen. So especially if you go to ports of Australia or Korea or Japan, you would see these things actually happening on the ground to be able to ha handle uh, green hydrogen. Uh, so yeah, so this is uh, on the marine storage part and this is on the shipping part. I talked about that. Then on the inland distribution, which is within the country, if you want to transport hydrogen, essentially it's either through truck. Uh, I talked about the large containers. You have rail hubs uh, through inland water transport. But of course, uh, everything has a cost attached to it. So we need to ensure that the transport modality being used is properly incorporated in terms of costing in our financial modeling. So either it would be in the form of a capex investment in the transport logistics, or more often it would be in a form of an operational cost. So it would be a fixed operational cost uh, uh, as a part of that in your financial model. So those are things that you need to take into account. Right. So then this is really the um, last part of the value chain, which is the end use case. Uh, on what is the offtake agreement that you have for hydrogen? Now around the globe right now, uh, people are not willing to enter into long offtake contracts for green hydrogen, essentially because uh, they do expect that there would be a reduction in the cost of the production. So, and you can see people want to avoid renegotiating contracts. So if, if you see the journey of renewable energy uh, in across the globe, the initial cost of renewable energy was quite high. So the offtake agreements that were entered, uh, what we call as feed in tariffs uh, by many governments, they were at a very high price. And then as the cost reduced, the renewable energy generation also reduced, and that's why uh, it became more and more competitive. So a lot of the earlier contracts that were entered into by off takers, they were then disputed. It went into dispute and it was a nasty. Uh, uh, it's a nasty business to go into dispute, get to get the resolution. It takes a very long time. So typically, uh, unless there is some support from the government in terms of off take, typically we see off take contracts of around uh, five years at max. Uh, sometimes even shorter to three years. So the typical range is around three to seven years, depending on uh, the off taker who, who is buying green hydrogen from you. And the most common usage is either for transportation, uh, for buildings, for heat and power of buildings, and then uh, for commercial use like steel industry, etc. So those are the three, whichever sectors are hard to abate, which already have uses hydrogen. So those are the sectors in which this is the has the highest potential. In in reality, although it looks good on paper, getting a good offtake agreement is really a challenge. It's a practical challenge to get uh, to agree on the volume number one, to agree on a price of offtake, and number three to agree on a tenor. So uh, there has to be a very strong business case for the offtake. Uh, uh, to be able to enter into a long term contract for green hydrogen purchase. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, three use cases. One is around uh, transport for fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, which, of course, the FCEVs or fuel cell electric vehicles are the only other vehicles besides battery, which don't uh, generate emissions. So uh, FCEVs have become an integral part of commercial fleets uh, by public, for public like buses, etc. They are becoming 
uh, an integral part of government's plans so that they can meet their NAC targets. So uh, because they need to reduce emissions as part of that. Uh, and also the fuel cells, uh, this is this has more application in commercial area rather than as a consumer car. Uh, like trucks, buses, heavy vehicles essentially. So they have a much more potential there. Again, the challenge here is that even if you have a hydrogen filling station, but then how is the network to be able to refill that truck again when it reaches from point A to point B? So that's again a practical challenge of implementing this, uh, which of course was a challenge for battery vehicles as well. Uh, as in more players come into uh, electric charging infrastructure that has been reduced to quite a bit. Similarly, uh, uh, as more developers or as more pilot projects come for hydrogen, then uh, this may be reduced as well. I, I talked about pilot projects because this is a very good way of actually doing hyd green hydrogen projects rather than thinking of very big numbers. So uh, like, for example, if you want to do a project which is of uh, 10 megawatt capacity, electrolyzer capacity, or 5 megawatt electrolyzer capacity, or 15, you know, so in something in the range of 5 to 15, it's much more easier to implement. You will still get the components to do this project. It's not very expensive, and the LCOS of hydrogen, which is the LCOE, sorry, the levelized cost of hydrogen would be uh, somewhere in the range of 4 to $6, which is very acceptable. As you grow on bigger and bigger plants, uh, Based on the studies that we have done so far as a party, uh, there is not a lot of case, business case for economics here. So the project economics don't reduce the cost of hydrogen to a very great extent based on the technology that is available till now. Yeah, maybe in maybe after one and a half, two years, once we have large electrolyzer capacities being manufactured, then uh, this may be the case. The project economics play a bigger role. Um, so as I said, filling station infrastructure is a key barrier for market expression of FCEs. That's mentioned here, right? And uh, the use cases are forklifts, buses, trucks, logistic vehicles. Then industry side, uh, as I said, steel industry is one, but also other things like oil refining, uh, ammonia, uh, conversion to ammonia, and then using it for agriculture, for urea production. Uh, that's also a major business case. Uh, and some work is also happening in synthetic, uh, sorry, sustainable aviation fuel, which we call as SAF, which is also has a green hydrogen as a component therein. So uh, if you want to really talk, uh, study a bit more about SAFs, uh, you can see certain case studies that are happening in, uh, within Asia, it's happening in Singapore. Um, uh, there, there's some work being done there uh, on SAFs. On uh, and deployment of that in some of the airlines, right? Singapore Airlines that they have. Now on the power side, uh, so some developers try to use hydrogen to convert into power for electricity use. However, this as a business case, uh, there there is a very uh, the business case is not very financially viable because, of course, you first use renewable energy to convert into hydrogen, then you convert it back into power. So of course, there are losses in the value chain. This has a business case in those areas or in those locations wherein uh, you are using hydrogen not just for producing power, but to also stabilize the grid, which has a higher renewable energy uh, input. So. If you are able to use green hydrogen as a power generation tool to be able to smoothen the grid or maintain that ancillary services function, then they might be a business case. But as a pure power producing fuel, uh, there's at least I have not come across a business case for this kind of a end use till now. But happy to be wrong if, if someone in the audience knows about that. So yeah, it would be good to hear that. OK. So I think this was the first part uh, of about introducing what green hydrogen value chain is and how we do the financial modeling. Uh, I'll take a pause for five minutes here if you, in case anyone has a question. You can type in the Q&A box. Otherwise, we can move to the next part of the model.
OK. So. It's good that no questions are there. I hope people are understanding. It means that people are very. OK, so then now let's move to. Uh, the modeling part. Now, what you see on the screen is a financial model that uh, uh, we have prepared for initial assessment of the levelized cost of hydrogen. Uh, we won't be sharing the financial model to the participants, but of course the recording would be shared with everyone so you can see uh, the recording. But of course, due to proprietary information, we can't share this model. I, I will try to take you through the essential components what we have captured here and then uh, answer any questions that you might have. So this is a small hydrogen plant. Let's assume a uh, hundred tons per day. Uh, I'll explain each and every component as well as the abbreviation so that you understand how this needs to be modeled. Efficiency of electrolyzer. So the parameter would be kilowatt hours per kilogram. What essentially this means is that how many kilowatt hours is required to produce one kg of hydrogen. So if I move back to the presentation that I was projecting, uh, just one sec. I can show you. Just one sec. So, so that you can relate to the things. So, so this uh, you have this. Uh, You have this uh, efficiency, right? Electricity demand megawatt hour per ton. So I've just converted that into kilowatt hours per ton. So it's in the range of 50 to 55, 45. Uh, I have assumed 60 here. Yeah, we can take it 50 as well. I think that's fine. So what it means is that if you want to produce 100 tons, then uh, you would have to uh, get 5,000 units of electricity, megawatt hours of electricity. Then Assuming that uh, you have a hundred percent into power availability, what it means is that you you have found a renewable energy source which provides you power for twenty four hours in a day. Okay, now if you are purely using a solar resource, this number would not be hundred percent. This would be a much lower number, something like forty percent or maybe twenty percent, based on the efficiency factor. If you combine solar wind hybrid along with the battery it can go up to uh without battery it can go up to 80 percent with battery it's around 100 percent so this assumes that you have a renewable energy capacity of source around uh to uh for the entire time so simply the formula for capacity is you divide 5000 divided by 24 so that this becomes the electrolyzer capacity, meaning 208 megawatt. Now, if I, I have chosen 100%, uh, I have chosen 80% availability source. So if because my so, uh, renewable energy source is not available 100%, I need to have expeditional electrolyzer capacity. So this essentially is 208 divided by 80% so that I can go to the sizing. So this is the sizing of electrolyzer. Now, as you can see, the uh, the base that we're starting from is the production, and that's usually the right way to start because you need to know how much is your offtake. So you start with your end use demand, and then what is the capacity required for electrolyzer, and now this would then impact your uh, costing. So the electrolyzer cost per megawatt. Uh, this is INR crores per megawatt. So in terms of dollars. If you want to convert, so this would be around 740. So this is in the this is for alkaline. So you can see this is in the same range, 500 to 1000. So this is electrolyzer, elect alkaline electrolyzer. So 740 dollars per kilowatt, and then this is on the storage part. So how much we're spending on storage? Uh, so 2.16. So what I showed you earlier, this figure. This is ammonia is 2.83, uh, so this assumes a lower number. Uh, so, so that's how you can check whether we are on the right track or not. So maybe this is really quite uh, aggressive. So should we then make it to maybe 
2.46. Yeah, this is more sounds like more reasonable. And then the total capital expended. So this is simply your per megawatt cost into your uh, so electrolyzer cost into electrolyzer capacity and the storage cost into your total hydrogen capacity. And then so this is just your capital expenditure. Now, of course, if you do your oh, anyone who is very familiar with project finance, I'm hoping people in the class are then uh, besides capex, you have other components to uh, capital uh, to the project cost. So in IDC and everything, project development cost, feasibility. So I was in 25 percent assumption uh, over and above 1603. So that's how this comes in. Then let's talk about the financing part. So uh, an equity contribution of around 30 percent, 70 percent debt. Uh, if if uh, uh, this is based on our experience, so typically we have not seen a case of 2030 for a green hydrogen plant in date. It's usually in the range of 2070. So of course, based on the project cost, you have the equity and debt available then, and uh, the corporate tax rate. Uh, return on equity expected 15%. So this is like a very, very base case. Typically developers who are into green hydrogen, you would see that they would demand at least 18 to 20% of equity IRR for their projects and then a cost of debt. Uh, depending upon again, uh, for each of these assumptions, as I said, you know, this is a, on a simplistic view for a very initial feasibility assessment that whether there is even a business case for sell of, sale of hydrogen based on the levelized cost that we are getting. Uh, as you go to a detailed financial model, you would have to break down each one on every one of them. So, for example, in the capex part, I, I showed you a single number of 740, but yeah, you will have to then break it down into the four components that I showed here. So, you know, stack power electronics, and there may be even further details available, uh, but this is the four that you would then really see. Uh, then, uh, yeah. So let, let's go to the operational life. So it assumes a 30 year operation life. Uh, operational days, 40 days in a year. So as I said, depending on the developer that you're working with or. Uh, uh, or the offtake agreement that you have, this can vary somewhere between 200 to 340 days. Now, if it's 200 days, then your uh, 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 then your cost of hydrogen would be much higher because you're actually using the plant to be a very low efficiency. So typically what we have seen in the market is around 300 plus. Uh, that's a usual trend. Uh, there was there was a question that uh, off take tenors, what is sort of debt tenors we are absorbing in the market? OK, so here what we see uh, in the market is the debt tenors are often linked to the offtake with a tail period of one year. Uh, a lot of the developers are actually assuming a notion in debt term. What it means is that they are actually focusing, they still take assumptions of around, uh, if it's a 30 year project, they take an assumption of around 20 years notion in debt term, and they assume a refinancing cost of every five years or so. So, because if you just assume five years of full debt repayment, then 90% of the projects would not be viable. So they need to assume a longer tenure of 20 years or so. And the understanding is that they would be able to refinance, which is very common for offshore wind projects as well. So it's the same issue with offshore wind that uh, except for countries maybe like Taiwan or uh, Japan, you, you're not able to get very long term contracts for offshore wind. So that's why there also there's a concept of notional debt term. OK. Then, uh, right, so ox consumption, so that's the consumption by electricity by the plant itself for its own running. Uh, so this is the system amounts that is required per day, which is essentially your base requirement of 5,000 plus additional 5%. Uh, operational expenses, again, this is a simplistic assumption of 5% and escalation of around 2% and then the unit cost of electricity. Now, this unit cost uh, is again very dependent upon 
the type of electricity that you have. So as I said, I chose something which is a renewable RTC, which is the which is available for 80% of the time. Now, if you choose something which is only solar, assuming for uh, only 20 to 40%, then uh, the cost of electricity would be lower, but then you need a larger amount of electricity. So in the end, it comes down to the same economics in terms of the financial outflow. So that's why the recommendation is that you find a power source which is at least available to 80 to 100 percent of the time uh, for a green hydrogen project because that is quite critical. So it, the location of the project is affected by that, the availability, whether the grid has the power available or not. So some of the European countries like Norway, for example, where 90 percent of the power in the grid is renewable energy, it, it's it's easier compared to Asia, wherein uh, the the grid is the grid has around 32 some place even less than 30, but 30% 30 is an average component of renewable energy in the grid. Then you have the unit cost of electricity. Uh, we talked about that. Other variable costs, if any. Uh, so the power cost right now we have assumed as 0%, which is fine. This is a fair assumption because a lot of the uh, offtake agreements that you can get from renewable energy developers, it's, it's a fixed price take or pay. So I think that's a, that's a fair assumption. Uh, now, this is the maintenance capex. Uh, every eight years, there's a uh, amount being incurred for the major capex, maintenance capex. This is very, very specific to the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the manufacturer, you know, uh, whom you're procuring uh, the electrolyzer to. Uh, so you can actually take, get a good, very parlance with battery. Or inverters. So if you go with battery or inverters of a certain type, you get the guarantee that you don't need any replacement for 15 years. You get warranties and everything. That kind of concept for warranty has not still come for electrolyzers, but then the maintenance cycles uh, the is really dependent upon uh, this parameter, uh, the lifetime thousand hours. So. For example, if you're using a PEM, you would you would essentially incur a lower maintenance cost over the project life compared to what alkaline one. Right. So so then uh, based on these assumptions, if you see that you know you have some calculations here, which is uh, a return on capital, return of capital. So essentially, uh, we have taken a levelized cost approach to calculate the cost of hydrogen, wherein we are trying to compute that given these assumptions above. What are the returns that we need? So number one, we would want the entire capital to be returned uh, to the developer, which is the entire capex of 2003. The interest on the loan has to be recovered. The return on equity, we talked about 15% has to be done on the equity component that you have. Operation and maintenance expense has to be recovered and the capital expenditure has to be recovered. So. Uh, those are the fixed costs that you have to recover out of the project. And then you have uh, the variable cost, which is the cost of power. So here, other variable cost is 589. As I mentioned earlier, that water can also become a part of a variable cost depending upon the plant location. So if pure water is not available at that location, uh, you might need to set up a, a, a facility around, if not desalination, but a water purification facility, and that might have a cost attached to it, which will either showcase as a part of your capex if you're doing it in-house, or it will showcase as a part of your opex if you're buying water from another source like electricity. Uh, so based on these things, so we have to recover all these items and uh, the total cost of production, if you compute, comes out to be this number every year. Right now, this is the total cost of production uh, based on addition of all the figures. Uh, and then you can actually get a per ton number or per kilogram number. Which comes out to be uh, basically the total cost every year divided by your production capacity. So we have not assumed any plant degradation here. Basically, no degradation in the electrolyzer capacity because we have assumed a maintenance cycle every eight years. Uh, some developers don't assume any kind of maintenance. Uh, but then they would then assume a re reduction in the capacity of hydrogen. So either of the things have to be assumed. So if you have 
no major maintenance and the hydrogen capacity also remains constant and there's something wrong. So that, that's where that understanding has to be there when you're doing financial analysis for such projects. So you come to the renewed cost and assuming a discount factor of 10%. So this is a, just a 10% discount factor that we have assumed. The levelized cost comes out to be around 5.2 USD per kilogram. Now, now this is becomes an important number because any discussions that a developer would have with an end user or an offtake egg off taker would be around this number. Uh, and this would determine the offtake agreement. So the lower you can get this cost to, uh, the uh, better chances of getting an offtake agreement. Uh, so to, to give you an example, for example, if we say that, okay, let me reduce my capex instead of 740 and maybe able to reduce it to uh, 5697, uh, 679, maybe let's reduce it to maybe 4.5. So that's around 500 range, you know. So if you're able to do that, of course, your uh, levelized cost becomes much more competitive. So, so this is really the first step of assessment that we have to do for financial modeling of such projects to even understand whether there's a business case for a project or not, because everything is dependent on op optic. It's not just about your input technology and everything, even after optimizing whether you're able to get an offtake agreement to do this. And, and there are certain ways that uh, uh, developers are able to secure that. So for example, uh, we recently spoke with a developer which is in Norway and uh, they are selling their green hydrogen to a, a marine operator, fleet operator, marine fleet operator. And that marine fleet operator has a public-private partnership contract with the government of Norway to operate uh, ships or marine, the smaller ships uh, between two stretches. So that has been out. So that has been uh, is under a PPP contract between government of Norway and that private contractor. So the government of Norway is actually subsidizing that private contractor that if you use hydrogen as a fuel for your ferries and for your transport system then I will compensate you under the PPP agreement. So, so that's how government is subsidizing that use and up to a certain range, of course, but that's what that particular developer has been able to secure a contract of around 15 years, which is quite rare. Typically, as I said, the off -take contracts in the range of five years or so, given that they expect that the cost of hydrogen would come down. So if, if you speak to a lot of the steel players, either in Korea or Japan, they also have a mandate to include green hydrogen as a part of their production process now from the government. And uh, we do see some contracts happening between uh, Australian uh, green hydrogen projects which are in Australia who have signed up an agreement with uh, off taker in Korea uh, for this because they have a mandate rule and government is compensating them. So that's one way that you need to create demand. The governments are creating demand for use of green hydrogen, but ultimately it comes down to this number that what is the price of green hydrogen that has been produced. Again, this is kind of a very broad breakup of how it looks around uh, the what is the key components of this levelized cost. So not just with this model, uh, uh, the variable, the input power cost, which is a renewable energy cost, that's actually the majority of the component, which is around 60%, 60 to 70% of the project cost or the L component of the LCOS. And the others are capex, recovery of capex, returns, and operational costs. So, uh, if, if you see a hydrogen project wherein the ratio of input power cost as a component of LCOS is uh, quite low, you know, meaning thirty percent or forty percent, then there's something wrong there. So that that's a broader benchmark that you can see. So I've given you some broader benchmarks that you can actually take care of either when you're doing a electrolyzer, so around 40 to 50 percent is on a stack cost that you can think. Uh, and similarly, the cost of storage, some benchmarks here for you. And again, the breakup of a levelized cost, how does it look like? So, so the idea for this for you uh, is to be able to judge whether the project that you're getting is a real project or not, or whether it's just on a drawing board on a paper, because there are many projects like that. A lot of those projects are still on drawing boards in form of PowerPoints uh, or in power form of Excel, not even Excel, just PowerPoint without a very solid financial analysis around that. 
and uh, we do come across such projects. So the idea here is to uh, spread that knowledge that you know which project is actually real and what are the things that uh, you should look for when you look at these hydrogen projects. So, so one question is around insurance premium that how do they compare with insurance premium for power projects? So, uh, uh, what what we have seen uh, as such, the the third party insurers are not available for these projects. Very typically, uh, some kind of insurance is pre-packed with the electrolyzer manufacturer itself that he would give some insurance around the component because it's very distinct. There is no single insurer who can cover the entire thing, especially in integrated plants. So that becomes quite challenging. So so. Yeah, so for the recovery of CapEx, OpEx, we have assumed a full 30 year life cycle. So we have assumed that. So if, if you see here, this model runs till 30 years. So we have assumed that everything gets recovered over 30 years. If you want to assume a shorter lifetime, of course, your LCOS should increase. Let's try that whether it increases or not. So if I assume a 20, so right now it's at 4.8. If I assume a 25 years, yeah, it increases to 4.9. So if you assume a shorter period, of course, your LCOS would increase. Just to wonder, I think it's increasing in points here. Yeah. So that's how it works. OK, so yeah, so I think that was a very sh short masterclass on green hydrogen on how it is done. Uh, now, when we move on to green ammonia, uh, the only the, the major change from what you discussed so far is essentially the cost of ASU. Air separation unit and the efficiency of conversion of uh, ammonia from hydrogen. So there is a conversion factor there as well. So similar, like right now, I showed you a conversion factor to convert uh, to get hydrogen from electricity, which is this factor that you saw here. The efficiency, uh, megawatt by ton HT, megawatt R divided by tons of hydrogen, or in other words, it's kilowatt hours per kg. Similarly, you would also have a conversion factor, which would be ammonia divided by hydrogen. So how much ammonia can be generated per hydrogen input, which goes into the, uh, uh, which goes after the ASU. So ammonia comes out of, sorry, nitrogen comes out of ASU, and then nitrogen and hydrogen are combined to produce ammonia. So how much hydrogen is needed for one ton of ammonia? That's another conversion factor. And of course, the cost of the ASU would be another part of the capex. So those are the two major changes in terms of the input cost. The idea is again to get you to get a cost of ammonia as an output to, to be able to see what is a possible offtake for that. So th this, this methodology of calculating the levelized cost is really the first step before you go into the full cash flow projections in terms of uh, the what are the lifetime because you would have to have the revenue assumptions as well. So right now it's on based on cost plus approach that we have come up with the cost of a, a very starting point for the conversation. OK, so that's all from my end. Uh, thank you everyone for your time today. I hope you found this uh, useful. We will circulate uh, a feedback form uh, for your honest feedback about this, and if you would like to incorporate any additional elements uh, in this masterclass. We, we will have a third edition of this masterclass, most likely in the month of July or August, and would be very happy to hear your feedback on what edition we can do there. Uh, and of course, the link to the recording would also be made available. I'll wait for a few minutes for the questions, if any. OK, I understand there are no more questions, but thank you again for your time and uh, for your patience and patient hearing. Thanks. Take care.